Breaking today on Secular is an earthquake shocks New York. Keeping you informed and engaged. Now more than ever. This is Seculo. We want to hear from you. Share and post your comments or call 1 800 684 3110. And now your host, Jordan Seculo. All right, welcome to Seculo. And that is correct. A 4.8 earthquake rocks New York in the tri state area, felt on the Amtrak lines. Now, I mean, to put things in perspective, as of right now, no major or any damage really reported. Yeah. There was a there was a ground stop. I know at some of the airports, which obviously that can cause delays. But those have already been lifted since this happened, and we've gone live on the air. So I mean, within the hour, there was ground stops put in and removed, which means pretty quickly they were able to determine. Can we actually not- determine that? Because uh, the news headline that just popped up on our screen just said the ground stops are in full effect. So can you just back that up just to make sure that we're... So maybe they didn't lift. That may have happened. We know we're about to hear from the governor of New York and the and Mayor Adams of New York City. Again, a 4.8 uh, earthquake centered in Lebanon, New Jersey, about 45 minutes west of New York City and 50 miles north of Philadelphia uh, is what hit. Obviously, this comes on the heels of the major uh, earthquake the, in Taiwan. So I think a lot of people have sort of their alerts up for what's going on in the world right now. Obviously, we head into the solar eclipse next week. There's a lot happening uh, in terms of sort of the, I guess, you, the, you, universe? the universe. And there's a lot of interest in this right now. As you said, no reports of damage just yet. We've seen videos where things are kind of rattling There's around some a little. saying where they were, like on Fox News, said, I think they said they didn't feel it. Yeah. What I, yeah, I think they're probably, other in, people in, they're probably inside a building, shit. inside of a building. Right. You know, they're maybe a little bit more protected. I do think what happens with a lot of these, and it happened actually in our Washington, D.C. studio when we when this happened a number of years ago there, which is maybe years down the road, you may see that there were things happened. We had lines that were so inside of a building, uh, you know, a cord that you couldn't reach in a historic building. That kind of things get, those things get damaged. Years. Um, those are the things that there may be with this level of, of earthquake. Now, I was told uh, by uh, Dr. Harry Hutchinson, which I, you know, I'm not usually the person going to him for advice on uh, earthquakes, but he did tell because you hear of these earthquakes that are happening around the world right now. You'll hear something like, you'll hear something like a seven or a six, and that is obviously a catastrophic earthquake and we want to know that the difference between a 4.8 and some of those like the one happened in taiwan is about a thousand times different so learning that uh is important i think it's important for all of us uh governor Hochul in new york said if you please leave a building if you feel that it is shaking or unstable uh and this is the largest earthquake on the east coast in a century so i don't want to downplay it either this is the this is not something that we're we're joking around about yet because anything can happen but i do want you to be aware Thankfully, uh, no, nothing has Yeah, happened. and that will not be our sole topic today. We will tell you we're going to move on, and we have a lot to discuss. You said uh, Newark, there's flights landing. Yeah, it appears the ground stop yeah. in Newark has been lifted. And we're, I'm still Sometimes I let things land. That, but hey, I, if you're in that area, give us a call. I'd love to hear from you. How, how are you experiencing this? If you felt it, give us a call. I'd love to hear from you quickly. We will get to you in the next segment. 1-800-684-3110. 1-800-684-3110. Uh, we are going to move on, though, here shortly and talk about some other things that are going on in the news. Jordan, maybe we can just give a little tease of what's going on. Yeah, that's up. right. We've had some action out of the case in Florida involving the classified documents in Mar-a-Lago and uh, Judge Cannon there, who's kind of been in this back and forth with Jack Smith. So we've got some... Uh, her motion, uh, she denied a motion to dismiss by President Trump, but within that motion, uh, you know, said it was really it was a timing issue, and she pushed back on Jack Smith. Remember the Presidential Records Act that we discussed a couple days ago, and the fact that Jack Smith, you know, thought that that even being in a potential jury instruction uh, was absurd, and that the only jury instruction should be his jury instruction, not the defense. And uh, she shot back and responded to that as well, which I think was more important. Uh, issue at play uh, within this document in this filing so we'll update you on that and uh, again that is the most complicated of the cases we would uh, imagine this classified documents case and how jack smith has tried to you know push this along as we get closer and closer to voting elections and and you know, being difficult for him in this case support our work at aclj.org our life and liberty drive continues double the impact Close to those 21,000. Yeah, we'll get some champions. Update. We get back here. Again, like Jordan said, aclj.org, and give us a call. We'll be back in one minute. 
Special counsel Jack Smith just hit back at the judge in Donald Trump's documents case. He went after her proposed jury instructions. She wants them based on two scenarios of Presidential Records Act. One would highlight personal records, the other presidential records. He called the entire argument unstated and fundamentally flawed. That legal premise is wrong, and a jury instruction that reflects that premise would distort the trial. He then requested that Judge Cannon rule one way or another on whether she thinks, again, this is a serious legal argument. Quote, it is vitally important the court promptly decide whether the unstated legal premise underlying the recent order does, in the court's view, represent a correct formulation of the law. She effectively thumbed her nose at Smith's request for a prompt decision, writing, quote, to the extent the special counsel demands an anticipatory finalization of jury instructions prior to trial, prior to a charge conference, prior to the presentation of trial defenses and evidence, the court declines that demand as unprecedented and unjust. She all but dared the special counsel's office to appeal to a higher court. Quote, as always, any party remains free to avail itself of whatever appellate options it sees fit to invoke as permitted by law. I've been in the courtroom for 30 years. I've had trials. A judge is asking both sides to propose jury instructions. There's no finality to these instructions, but Jack Smith is obsessed with going to trial before the election. The judge is only trying to figure out with her request for instructions, how she might handle a matter if the evidence evolves a certain way during the trial. Jack Smith is uh, apoplectic at this point about the notion that the Presidential Records Act has some play in a case involving a former president. I think, I stand by my analysis, it clearly does. And that's why they're having all of these shenanigans about jury instructions that have uh, Jack Smith and his underlings very worried about how this trial plays out. So there's a movement in the Presidential Records Act case, the classified documents case. This is the case in Florida. Jack Smith, President Trump, the raid on Mar-a-Lago, the, the documents. Are they his? Are they classified? Were they declassified before? President, how does the Presidential Records Act come into play? Um, again, the, the president's power to declassify on their own without, a for, without going through a formal process. All these legal issues and whether or not the court even wants to uh, long term, whether a court will even want to determine those bigger questions, because uh, you could see a case like that, even on an issue like that, going to the Supreme Court on just the issue of whether or not a court is going to determine what a uh, law, a system that was set up for the president to benefit the president so that they could have classified information, but also at any moment declassify it for anyone. You don't have to have like, the president doesn't have to worry about your security clearance to have to tell you if they want to information that is he go on tv and start reading uh, classified information so it's a the question is if you don't document it somehow then do you, are you just able to say well i declassified this yeah th i think those rules have been and, a little that's, blurry that's what's blurry here now what happened in this court filing to will depend on kind of like what news channel you watch and one issue a motion to dismiss from president trump was denied but but it was denied because it, the the judge in this case eileen can said it was too early to file this specific motion and it was on the it was, that motion was saying because of the presidential records act this case can't move forward the secondary issue though was just a couple days ago remember the jury instructions which are actually more important because i'm not sure these cases are going to get dismissed um because again like i just said i think you're going to finally have a court going to is at least going to weigh in to say whether or not this is uh, appropriate for the courts and that's going to take more than probably just motions uh, but what she said was, uh, you know, what does President Trump seem? What would you like in the jury instruction? Went to Jack Smith. What would you like in the jury instruction? None of these were final. And the Jack Smith and the prosecutors, they pitched a fit that President Trump was even allowed to put, uh, they even suggested to put the Presidential Records Act in, and specifically uh, that that would be a defense. And she responded within this denial to Jack Smith. And I think that's this is actually the most important part of this document. It's on page two. It says, uh, separately, to the extent the special counsel that Jack Smith demands an anticipatory finalization of jury instructions prior to trial, prior to a charge conference, prior to the presentation of trial defenses and evidence, the court declines that demand as unprecedented and unjust. The court's order soliciting preliminary draft instructions on certain counts should not be misconstrued 
as declaring a final definition on any essential element or asserted defense in this case. So basically, continuing that that move on Jack Smith is like you complain and complain before decisions are even made. Yeah, we're, you complain we're that, that. that people are putting that people put information forward that I even allow them to put information forward. Not even that I'm accepting that information as something in the instruction, but that they're allowed to even make their own recommendations. I don't know if this is Jack Smith intentionally slowing things down because he now knows the time is against him and he can't get to Trump before the elections because of the the way that uh, the, the missteps he's had so, and some of the other issues, you know, like they've had in Georgia and the list goes on. Or uh, is this is this just a move to – he just wants to be in a fight with this judge. Yeah, I think we have questions and comments coming in. I think we should take our phone call actually coming right now. If you want to be on the air, one 800 Six eight four three one one zero about this topic about the earthquake whatever you'd like we'd be happy to discuss uh, as much as we can here on this Friday let's go to Michael who's calling on line one who's watching it on YouTube if you're watching on YouTube as well and you're brand new to this broadcast I ask you to subscribe hit that thumbs up really appreciate it Michael you're on the air yeah I just wanted to focus on Jack Smith the empty indictments the illegitimate indictments against Trump. I mean, if you want indictments, I handed presidential candidate General Wesley Clark war crimes indictments for bombing Yugoslavia, but President Trump hasn't done anything. It's all illegitimate, and he never committed an insurrection. But General Wesley Clark, he bombed Yugoslavia. They destroyed Yugoslavia, and yet Russia has attacked them on Serbia. Wesley Clark was the president, so he was getting instructions uh, as NATO's supreme commander, I think, at the time. and so there's there's issues there. You're not gonna, you might not like their decisions, but they get immunity too from actions if they're following the orders correctly. But presidents do as well. We talk. We have talked about this a lot. Um, again, the, the specifics on Yugoslavia, not so much. I do get the point. The point, but again, a president even has more immunity. Now, what they're alleging though is not that there's been no actions taken here. They, they're saying, well, in this case, it was that you took documents you're not supposed to take. And if you do that, um, it can be criminal. And, of course, there are people that have been prosecuted. There are people currently being prosecuted in the government for ha- taking classified documents or even just mishandling classified documents. You can go to jail for that, Logan. You don't have to be, it doesn't even have to be that intentional. But when it comes to the president, they have the ultimate power around these documents. They're the only person who could literally have the most classified, important secret document in their possession and literally pull a random person off the street and read it to them. Yeah, and I think somewhat that's presidential power that do you, that, you would allow. How can you ever really violate that law by having these documents? Yeah, I think that's the big debate. Is how, and we also know that remember they didn't bring it against Joe Biden. Yes, we all know that this happened to, to Joe Biden. Likely, this has happened to other presidents as well. They said, it, you know, listen, these are guys that one. Is it, you look at age. You look at the fact that it's a bunch of kids handling their boxes uh, when they when they are moving out of office. Thousands and thousands of documents. So if you tried to take this into court, most of the time a jury would say, sure. well, if I, had to hand, if I had to put myself in that position and I had millions of these documents and a week to get, get them moved somewhere and then also classify which ones need to go back to this person, which ones have to go back to this person, which ones have to go yeah, this it, there's, it's going to be a mess. That doesn't seem very criminal. It's very different than the individual taking the one document to sell to the Russians. You know, I mean, that's different. That's a, that's an easy crime. You can point that you know, all the different crimes there, but when you have lots of these documents, you're sorting through, and you're, you've only been out of office for less than a year. People, I think, have a lot more sympathy to say, "I don't think this was like an intentional move to do anything wrong. This was just like a part of the issue of being president of the United yeah. States." There is a press conference right now. Yeah, Mayor Adams is doing a press conference. Yeah, on we should give an the, update on the earthquake. I know a lot of you are tuning we in. Hit any of that. that? We, we were discussing it. It seems like there's nothing really going on. Mayor Adams said New York should continue their day. Okay. Uh, obviously, be aware. So I think they're trying They're trying to wrap this up as well. So uh, su- like Subway wor- is on. I think everything is, is working. They said it's a developing situation. I think what's happening is like emergency alerts are just hitting phones. Oh, so you also have that, which is now they're getting alerted. But we actually have a good call related to the topic of Jack Smith. I think we should go back to that. But there is really the update, if you're, you're joining us right now, about the earthquake. Obviously, the biggest earthquake that hit the East Coast in over 100 years but it seems like damage is minimal. We will keep an eye on it if something comes up. We are having our team right now monitor Mayor Adams' press conference that's happening in New York City right now. Felt in New York City, felt in the surrounding areas, Pennsylvania and in New Jersey. I think it actually hit directly in New Jersey. Uh, again, this comes on just the heels of the giant earthquake that happened that really uh, rocked the world. And then you have uh, next week, 
you have the solar eclipse that is becoming popular right now. So a lot of people are talking about what's happening in the world and what it means. And look, I'm looking at your comments right now. I know a lot of you have a lot of deep thoughts on that. I wouldn't mind hearing from some of you. They're playing with that down a lot because they say we're not going to be able to see it. it well, it may not be. It may be too cloudy. Let's go to Jim, who's calling in South Carolina line, too. Uh, Jim, you're on the air. Hey, guys. How are you? Good. So there's been a lot of discussion around um, whether or not Jack Smith is is legally appointed. You know, even Edward Meese, I guess, expressed the opinion he's not. So I'd love your opinion on whether or not he's legally appointed, whether or not the money he's spending was properly appropriated. I mean, listen, we've gone through the special counsels. You don't have to like it. It's a part of the, the law that's set up through the Department of Justice. It's different than an independent counsel. It's not like what Ken Starr was, that they don't have that kind of authority. Uh, it's not congressional. So it's the Department of Justice, basically, the Attorney General can decide that a issue warrants someone uh, specifically being appointed to this position that can act almost independently, though they are still serving the Attorney General. They could actually technically be, I think, you know, fired by the President uh, uh, in that situation. That uh, they, they, again, they have their own budget. Usually they, they do have to get some of that approved. Uh, and, of course, they have to provide updates to the Department of Justice, usually to the Deputy Attorney General uh, that oversees, depending on – but I don't know of any situation in Jack Smith's situation. I think, again, charges that he's brought, the cases that he's brought, and if you look at his background as well uh, with the Department of Justice, uh, he's you know good at getting indictments, bad at getting convi uh, convictions upheld. But I haven't seen any issues that you know that was in inappropriate – under the law, I don't like the issues of special counsel. I don't think that they should be necessary. I think we pay for an entire Department of Justice, and they should be able to carry out these jobs. But that is a, a part of the law. We have gotten rid of the independent counsel, which I think was a good move. But uh, special counsel still there. It's, it's a tool. Members, it's also a tool they use to protect themselves, where Joe Biden could, and Merrick Garland can say, see, we, we put forward this special counsel to investigate the documents. So you can't say that it was us doing Absolutely. Look, our legal work never ends here at the ACLJ. We are right now kicking off our month of April Life and Liberty Drive. We would love for you to be a part of it. Uh, again, focusing a lot on that liberty part of that life and liberty for this month. We've, these are just a few battles that we are currently in. Yesterday, we filed a critical brief in the Georgia court. Heard about that. We'll discuss that a lot more coming up uh, with going on with the Funny Willis situation. We are battling the Biden deep state 18 new lawsuits. We've delivered a demand letter to the U.N. Security Council earlier this week. You've seen some of that in last week. I do want to tell you, coming up, you're going to hear how the Biden administration, of course, said their new laws, their new things they're going to pass. They weren't going to target you, just the, the people who you want them to be. Of course, guess what? It's coming back for you. We're going to hear from Harry Hutchinson right after this. ACLJ.org to support the work, and all donations are matched. We'll be right back. New information. This is the case out of Florida, of course, involving those classified documents, probably the longest case in all of the cases involving President Trump because you've got classified documents, you've got a number of uh, presidential records acts, a number of different laws that come into play. And Jack Smith doesn't like the fact that Judge Cannon in this case went to both sides, the prosecution and defense, and said to propose a jury instruction that she would then kind of mold into one instruction for the jury that they would ultimately get. And, Logan, uh, Jack Smith doesn't want the Trump uh, defense team to have any role in this. So maybe you can explain to us, in a bit more layman's terms, okay. what's happening right now. So they're going up there, and now there's an argument over who gets to hear the rules or what rules so get to is, be presented. As you are selecting, preparing to select jurors, jury. yep. and you've gone through the grand jury process, so you're getting closer and closer to a court date. You have to come up with an instruction for the jury. What is the jury looking to find in this case while they sit there? So are they what you know, what is the prosecution saying you did wrong? What is the defense saying they did not do? We need to first go, yes. This is the classic case. This is like the original or uh, one of the original cases you've heard about for years. Right. There's just This is the know, raid on Mar Lago. It just this is the raid on Mar Lago. This just takes time. All of these things take time. A lot of time. You're innocent until proven guilty. guilty. Everyone's heard that before. So if you took out your entire defense from the jury instruction, which is, do you believe them on this? Do you believe that they believe this? Imagine if they can do this to you, that the only jury instruction would be that you're guilty because you did X, Y, and Z, and it doesn't give another option for the jury. That would be, again, it's ultimate lawfare. It's absurd. But it's also been part, Logan, 
of this attack on this specific judge because she happens to be a Trump nominee. It's like because she's a Trump nominee, she has to be disqualified. Welcome back to Secular. We are taking your phone calls to 1-800-684-3110. Look, I think we can answer Todd's question right off the bat. So we were talking about uh, Judge Cannon, about Jack segment. Smith, the classified documents sure. case, and uh, also the investigation into pre- uh, President Biden with his classified documents issue. Yeah, let's go to Todd, who's calling in Georgia, listening on the radio. Todd, welcome. You're on the air. Yes, uh, thanks for taking my call. I don't understand how uh, Biden, as a uh, you know, senator and vice president, can get away with having classified documents when President Trump is the only person in the entire country that has a right to these documents. And, you know, this is such a biased and prejudicial prosecution. You know, uh, is his, are his lawyers ever going to raise that issue with the judge? I mean, it's not really an issue. I get the talking point, right? Because I agree with you that it's the way that President Trump is being treated by the, the court system is lawfare is what we've called it. It's like it's, they're going after every possible potential. If they can file it, they will file it to make you go through the process to try and almost like freeze you out, distract, make it look like you know you couldn't be president because you've got all these issues and uh, all these uh, different uh, cases that you've got to pay for and millions and millions of dollars of legal fees that you've got to do in this state and that state, and your criminal fees and civil fees and federal court and state court uh, and in the city court in New York as well. You can't do business here anymore. But – What you can't say is that, oh, because Joe Biden didn't get charged for it, that Donald Trump can't either. You know, that's not how our legal system works. It's not – it's prosecutors look at what they're they're able, the evidence, and they decide, can I – am I going to really be able to convince a, 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 a jury, a court, a judge on some matters, uh, at, at specific legal standards that this was committed? And that it was done intentionally, or you have to go through the elements of a crime. And Robert Hur, who was investigating Joe Biden, said, you know, ultimately, he thought the way he would come across was too old and probably just like uh, an old man who didn't know anything about these pages. And so he'd have a very difficult time prosecuting him in front of a jury. Jack Smith knows that's not an issue for Donald Trump. And Jack Smith decided, I think I could take this to a jury. And I could, I think I could get him convicted. So that's decisions they have to make with the facts that they have researched. I want to go right uh, to Harry Hutchinson though, because Harry, interesting here, we have a new article out by the IRS right around you know the tax season in April, and we've warned about this throughout the Inflation Reduction Act that it was about you know they were always about about the one percent and and uh, that the the most wealthy were going to be who the IRS wanted to target. But the truth is, the most wealthy have attorneys and accountants putting together all their tax returns and extensions and things like that. And we said it's going to be the middle class. And now the Wall Street Journal's got the issue. Uh, We know that as of last summer, 63% of new audits targeted taxpayers with income of less than $200,000 right at the middle class. Uh, Again, 80% of audits covered filers earning less than $1 million. So it was nothing about the top 1% or even the top 1% of the 1%. You're precisely correct. So essentially, the IRS has launched an improvised explosive device aimed at the American middle class. In other words, they're saying to the American people, we are going to raise taxes by increasing our audit focus on the middle class. And so the IRS, um, as part of Joe Biden's plan to revive the economy, has sought to hire a new army of tax collectors to audit uh, the American people, up to 20,000 new employees over the next decade. However, the plan has fallen short in the sense that they have not been able to hire uh, the number of agents that they have uh, targeted. Uh, Now, it's important to keep in mind that the IRS has promised and pledged that the audits would target the wealthy. Uh, But we also know now that the audits that have taken place so far have disproportionately targeted uh, the middle class. And so you're precisely correct. As of last summer, 63% of new audits targeted taxpayers with income of less than $200,000. 
The only good news, I think, in the report is that the revenue agents that they've been able to recruit has fallen way short of their objective. In other words, they've only been able to hire 34 agents, according to the Wall Street Journal, in the first six months of this so-called expansionary phase, even though the IRS goal was 3,700. So what should the American people do in response to all of this? Uh, They should be energized to claw back the more than $80 billion that the Democrats have funneled in this uh, tax enforcement scheme that disproportionately targets the middle class. I mean, this again, this was in the Inflation Reduction Act. We warned people about what this was going to do, that this was a boost, uh, that you could call it, and again, the, it, the IRS was getting, this was the $87 billion to the IRS, the 87, uh, the 87,000 new employees, $80 billion. And so far, uh, that the total that has been, will be allocated right now, looking at 80 billion, uh, 79.4 billion. Um, the 87,000 number is the estimated IRS could hire about 86,852 new full-time employees. Uh, they still have, you know, they're having issues with implementing all of this, of course, and actually, uh, can you be surprised the IRS is having issues with all the paperwork of hiring new people and going through this and actually spending the money? Usually they're actually pretty good at spending the money, but the bigger issue at play here is that, remember, this was all going to be paid for itself, they said. Yeah. And the way that they're paying for it is by going after people who can't afford attorneys and can't afford accountants and don't have uh, sophisticated tax attorneys looking at how they're filing their taxes. They're going at the increase in who's being audited well, is people making less than $200,000 a year. That's a 60% increase. 80% of the people audited individually are making under a million dollars a year. So it's not about the top 1% or the top 5%. It is about the middle class, actually uh, even uh, lower middle class. So people that are hurt the most by these audits. Yeah, no one seems to be shocked in the chats I'm watching. This seems like, of course, this By is the way, what do they think up. they're going to ultimately get? You're not going to re- recover billions of dollars from these people. Right. So you're not going to be able to pay for your $80 just billion dollar plan yeah. with uh, just targeting a bunch of people who make under $200,000 a year. It's just a lot easier because uh, you could scare them into some settlement, and you can't scare someone who's making a right. you know, million plus dollars a year into so- those kind of settlements so easily because they have a whole team of people preparing their documents. Absolutely. Hey, we only got about a minute and a half left of this segment. Some of you only get us on your local radio stations for the first half hour. If not, you should be joining us online. We're live live broadcasting full television-style broadcast on YouTube, on Rumble, on ACLJ.org. You can find all the links there. And we are right now just kicking off the April Life and Liberty Drive because our legal work never ends. You've heard all the cases we're working on. You've heard people today uh, discuss what's happening around the world. I mean, even just the fact they're able to come on here and report to you about this earthquake that's happening, hopefully you're able to get this information for us at absolutely no cost. And I think that's what's really important for you to understand, is there is no cost to you, the user. Now, however, as a member of our audience, and you find value in this broadcast, you find value in the legal work that we do, I want to encourage you to support the work of the ACLJ. Help us fight these crucial battles. Help us support us in our media fight so people actually can see the truth. Be a part of it right now. Your tax-deductible gifts will be doubled at ACLJ.org for this month. Also, if you can, become an ACLJ champion. That's someone who supports the work of the ACLJ on a monthly recurring basis. We'd like to hit our goal of 21,000 champions in the next few days. And we are only 125. That's updated even since this copy was in front of me. 125, the six new ones that came in during the broadcast. You can do that right now. Become ACLJ champion by going to ACLJ.org, making your donations, and opting in to being a monthly supporter. Second half hour coming up. This break is less than a minute, so don't go anywhere. The ACLJ fights the battles that matter most to our members. We listen to you, and we're taking action through the ACLJ Life and Liberty Drive. Every dime we receive goes to defend life and liberty from Capitol Hill to Geneva to the United Nations. Now is the time to fight. The rights to life and liberty are the cornerstones of our constitutional republic, but they are under attack. That is why we're proud to announce the return of the ACLJ Life and Liberty Drive. This month, we're redoubling our efforts to beat back the radical left's attacks on your constitutional freedoms and to defend the sanctity of human life, not just here at home, but around the world. 
every gift you give will be doubled dollar for dollar, doubling your impact for life and liberty. Go to ACLJ.org right now and help us. Keeping you informed and engaged. Now more than ever. This is Seculo. And now your host, Jordan Seculo. A couple of issues at, at play. If you are watching the news or listening to the news, you're probably hearing about the earthquake in the Northeast, specifically in New York City. I felt all the way down to Washington, D.C., the also tri state area. You had airport closures, then we'll say most of those have changed. They are worried about some, maybe some after aftershocks, but so far, nothing, uh, no damage, no one injuries. Um, you don't want to go too far ahead of these things because, again, that could take time. And I get, these are old buildings, but. Uh, it wasn't uh, anything that you could like see like in Taiwan that happened in Taiwan. Um, so right now, though, it is still dominating the news because when you have any of those closures of transportation, those major transportation sector in the United States, that alone causes big delays and yeah. issues for people that can last for days just to kind of get things rescheduled. So it looks like that was pretty quick. But um, again, have we confirmed if they've opened up all the airports? Yeah. Yeah, so some some we know are back at operational, um, and the, the mayor of New York has said, "Go about your day, go about your business." Yeah, I think they said, you know, if you notice a building is shaking, get out of it. I think that's the pretty much the extent of it. Hopefully, yeah. that ends up being the extent. Are we good on this phone call? Can we go ahead? Let's go to Mike, who's calling in North Carolina on line three. Mike, welcome. Hey, Mike. Hey, uh, just say appreciate all y'all do. Uh, this is in regards to the classified document case. Uh, I was wondering, is it inching closer to election? And if this thing does get pushed past the election and Trump were to win as president, would he be able to retroactively go back and declassify those documents? I mean, all he'd have to, I, I think it'd be over, Mike. And the reason why is because you could pardon yourself. And that's it. I mean, even if Jack Smith somehow could step, put a hold on the case because of the Justice Department policy of the 60, the 90 days, or if he, even if he disagreed with that, thought he could continue to prosecute the president. The president's got ultimate pardon power. And what, I mean, that hasn't been challenged either. And I, I so I think there's a lot of issues for, for all of these challenges, especially the federal challenges. Um, there's been issues with the state challenges, too. We just filed yesterday in Georgia that Fannie Willis brought on upon herself um, and the way she used taxpayer money there. But on the federal challenges... I think these are all done if Donald Trump wins. People don't like talking about it like that because I don't think and he's not running to, you know, that's not his top issue either. I mean, you're not running because I can get rid of two lawsuits that I think he can beat ultimately in court. But when he, if he does win, he can decide and instruct. He could, I mean, he might not have to sell. He might not even have to pardon. You might even be able to instruct the Department of Justice. Now, can Congress then take some negative action on you and you go through some impeachment thing? Sure. Are there going to be votes there, though, for the two-thirds required to actually remove you from office? Likely not. So, again, you could see how this plays out into a, another right. kind of wild scenario. But Jack Smith is – they're all nervous because they're getting close to running out. They've run out of time, and they, they have well, – again, because they brought, and like he has done in the past, kind of junky cases. And we're 213 days, as look, from Election Day. So I think they know – the clock is starting to run out. Yeah, legally, I mean, that's yeah. not a lot of time to we bring a, in. We actually have a call coming in. We'll take it in the probably the final segment. Maybe we'll try to get you in the next segment there, Michael. But I do think we're going to have Rick Grinnell joining us in the next segment. If you have a question, his question is related to the election that, again, is only 213 days away. That sounds like a lot. It's not a lot. We all know that's not a lot. It'll be here before we know it. Do you have a question regarding this upcoming election? Maybe you uh, have Curious about what laws got changed. Did things get temporarily changed? That's what Michael's call is related to. I know people have that on their mind of what this is actually going to look like in terms of the election. I mean, really quickly, you can, I can say this. You have to know in your state. There's 50 different laws. Yeah. Well, if you have a specific question or comment, give us a call. 1-800-684-3110. In the last segment of the broadcast, we like to take as many calls as we can. So we're going to have a guest coming up, Rick Riddell, obviously part of our team. And then the, the segment following that. We're going to take all the calls we can. So it's, it's related to the topics we've addressed today. It's also Friday, so we're able to get a little looser on some of those topics. So give us a call, 1-800-684-3110. That's 1-800-684-3110. I'm going to ask you right now to become a member of the ACLJ by becoming an ACLJ champion. We are so close 
I have to check with the current, but as of last segment, 125 away from our goal of 20, 21,000 ACLJ champions. That's 21,000 of you that are dedicated to giving to this organization each and every month, whether you like the media content we do, the legal work we do, or the legal work that we can even do for you, absolutely no cost. We'll be right back with Rick Riddell. Following on from Monday's airstrike on the Iranian embassy in the Syrian capital, Iran has vowed to retaliate. Two generals and five military advisers were killed in that attack, which is widely believed to have been carried out by Israel. General Zahidi was a commander in the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Quds Force and a key figure in Iran's proxy war against Israel that provides training and weapons for terror groups in the region. Iran is threatening a harsh retaliation, and Hezbollah said the enemy would receive punishment and revenge. The failure of the Israeli regime in Gaza will continue, as well as these desperate efforts, like what they did in Syria. Of course, they will be slapped for this action. This entity's attack on the Iranian Republic's consulate in Damascus, which will not remain without a response, indicates the pinnacle of failure. This is what the Iranian foreign minister says on screen. An important message was sent to the American government as a supporter of the Zionist regime. America must be held accountable. One former Israeli intelligence chief says that Tehran might choose this Friday to carry out some sort of a revenge attack for what happened in Damascus. Did the CIA warn Israel or did President Biden warn Netanyahu today about an Iranian plan to attack inside Israel within 48 hours? I'm not going to talk about intelligence matters, Peter. I think you can understand. Um, but uh, they did talk about uh, a very public uh, and very viable, real threat by Iran. The IDF says it's bolstering air defenses and is calling up reservists while issuing calming messages to the public that there is no need to stockpile on emergency items or to withdraw money. I think they're caught by surprise, but it's likely they're going to apply additional pressure against the United States, believing that the United States is going to be willing to apply pressure to constrain Jerusalem and so thereby achieve their ends without having to directly confront Israel. And again, Israel has provided a path for us to recognize exactly what should be done to hold the Iranians accountable. So to add to the headlines, Rick Rennell, our senior advisor for foreign policy and national security, is joining us. Rick, of course, a former ambassador to Germany and former uh, director of national intelligence. We see this headline, Rick, uh, to add to all the day's interesting headlines about you know, earthquakes in New York, but then also that uh, the CIA warns Iran will attack Israel within 48 hours as revenge for consulate strike. And, again, what we have in that, I mean, that's about all the info we got. It, 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 they quote a couple former CIA officials. Uh, they talk about, again, we know there was the consulate strike. We know that there were uh, Iranian uh, Revolutionary Guard generals killed in that strike that was in Syria at an Iranian uh, consulate and that that strike was carried out by Israel so that the retaliation would be targeted at Israel. What we don't know is, you know, where that retaliation could be and what is targeted uh, for Israel. But I think, you know, it presents one of those matters when when we see one of these stories, this would help people out too, and kind of run like this in the news, what do you think people's first reaction should be? I mean, because it's pretty, you know, scary headlines. For It has a specific timeline. And it's pretty, you know, it's pretty scary stuff. Iran's going to respond with something, you know, deadly, and that's all they give us. Well, first of all, let's let's uh, talk philosophically about why we have intelligence. Why do the American people pay taxes, hard-earned taxes, in order to have intelligence agencies? The answer is that our intel and all of the collections that we do is designed to keep America safer. It's designed to give public policy officials who are making the choices about our our safety, it's designed to give them the best information possible so that public policy officials can react and make sure that they're keeping America safe. So when you have information like this, it's supposed to go to the public policy officials to react. Now, let's remember that for two months, we heard Intel officials and the White House talk constantly about the fact that there would be a war in Ukraine. We heard Joe Biden say the Russians are coming, the Russians are coming, the Russians are coming into Ukraine. And we didn't react. We didn't, um, you know, surge diplomacy. We didn't try to do anything other than buckle down and prepare for war. And I, I find that to be 
uh, wrong. I find it to be immoral. When you have information that there is an attack coming or a plan of action, the United States of America needs to react. So if we know that Iran is going to attack our ally Israel, we better be doing something about it. And from this report, I'm not even sure that people are taking it that seriously. I mean, it looks like the only uh, uh, the, the country taking it seriously is Israel. They've, you know, there's a number of their embassies that they've evacuated uh, in response to this. So there, I mean, obviously, there's a someone got this out because they believe something needed to be said publicly to warn people, possibly, uh, and and that could be again because they don't think that the U.S. is taking it seriously enough. And in fact, we're seeing a lot of criticism of what Israel did. And and not so much about you know, the fact that Iran is continuing to carry out, you know, escalating escalating the situation between Israel. In fact, I mean, we know, uh, Rick, we go back to October 7th. I mean, this was all being backed by Iran. Hamas wouldn't have had the abilities to even carry out these attacks without Iran's support. So if you're talking about who's escalating this conflict, uh, it's the it's the uh, Islamic Republic of Iran. Look, I think that the reason this information is leaking out is because there are a lot of people within the intel community, within the diplomatic community, within the Pentagon community, who are very concerned that the Joe Biden administration is too weak, that they're not responding, that they're sitting on the sidelines and watching, and they're very concerned about it. So they're, they're shooting a warning to say, oh my gosh, look what could happen. And and hopefully that is, uh, you know, enough of a media response where people then have to confront the White House to say, what are you doing to protect our allies? What are you doing to protect Americans in the region? Because we don't know exactly where this attack is going to be. And we've got a lot of Americans in the region, including U.S. troops. And, and ultimately, I mean, Rick, would, would this again, it seems to go to this point of is the administration, because I mean, I mean, reading into this, what we're seeing is Israel is being blamed for this. Uh, potential for an Iranian attack. So now that if if you target Iran as a terrorist state and you target any of their actors, which uh, you've been in an administration that did as well, that somehow it's your fault uh, that Iran is is a terrorist state and that you're provoking them, and that it's, it's Israeli's fault that they, you know, I guess that October seventh occurred. We're never going to convince the left wing uh, types and the media types who who just always want to blame America and blame Israel. But the reality is, is in the Trump administration, we had Iran uh, without money. We froze all of their um, assets. There were sanctions on them. There were worldwide pressure and it was working. And in the Biden administration, they decided to uh, open up the sanctions, open up cash and credit to the tune of hundreds of billions of dollars. And now we're in a position where all of that money that was unleashed by Joe Biden is being used against America and America's allies in the form of war. We would not have had October 7th, 181 days ago, if Joe Biden had not funded uh, this Iranian regime who then went out and started funding all their, their terrorist proxy groups. Yeah, I mean, Hamas was, had much better resources, much better capabilities. And, and then, uh, of course, the, and also knew that they could, uh, they were willing to, carry out an attack like this and suffer the repercussions. I mean, they talk about, of course, you know, how horrible things are in Gaza, but they knew what would happen if they carried out an attack that extreme on Israel. If it was, in their minds, you know, successful, if they killed that many Israelis and Jews in one day, what would happen in response? And we're, we're still seeing, uh, even uh, today, Rick, you know, these articles, uh, and it's true that there's not a ton of Democrats elected who take the pro-Hamas position, but what the Democrat Party is concerned about is that there are more and more Democrats who just stay quiet on the issue, that they don't want to speak on the pro-Israel position. And, you know, who's going to win the, those elections inside the Democrat primary? I'm not an expert on their primaries, but I do see that silence more and more. And then you see the speech by Schumer and you say, wow, it feels like they're under a lot of pressure to, to somehow be critical of Israel, even if it's being critical of a specific Israeli. Look, the rational foreign policy people uh, are not being listened to. Uh, the people who are being listened to right now by the, the Biden team, and it's not Joe Biden, he's a shell of a, of a politician right now. It's Anthony Blinken, it's Jake Sullivan, it's that whole team. What, what has happened is, is the foreign policy rational thinkers have been shoved aside, and the political people are making the decisions. The political people who care about Michigan and Detroit and want to win an election, so everything is political, those are the people 
who are calling the shots on on Israel right now. And that's that's very sad to me because it's been 181 days. We still have hostages. We still have American hostages that are being held by a terrorist organization. And we should be hearing about the hostages every single day. We should have a countdown clock on every single media uh, outlet telling the American people how many days that we've had uh, people held against their will, Americans held against their will by a terrorist organization three and a half years after uh, Donald Trump brought in peace deals between the Arabs and the Israelis. We appreciate uh, your insight. Rick Cornell is part of the team at the ACLJ because of your support of the ACLJ. We're going to take your calls too, folks. We come back for the break at 1-800-684-3110. But I mean, look, I think when you get that info from Rick, too, you can, we can look through all these issues. One is um, you know, being in those rooms, making those decisions that uh, that could lead to either those consequences or prevent these kind of actions that we saw under President Trump, but also not being afraid to take acts like taking out the head of the Revolutionary Guard, which the Trump administration did and, uh, and made the decision to do, uh, which you know the Iranians are still utilizing as a reasoning uh, for uh, for their attacks. Though, th- th- I mean, it's a pretty clear difference. It's it's again, you can have, you could be an allied you know country and have differences, and you you. What you do is you handle those differences behind closed doors. And you can have really strong differences. You can have really big arguments, but you don't have to make them public. When you start making public speeches like Chuck Schumer about Netanyahu, it's not like they were ever politically on the same side. Netanyahu was always more on the right side. Yeah. Schumer was more on the left. But the fact that Schumer, Schumer thinks to, he was that's there, going though. to help him yeah. politically in New York. Yeah, exactly. That's when you see that the movements are all about politics. It has nothing to do with actual conviction. Because Schumer, for the longest time, was at least someone who you knew as the sort of You would think he'd Zionist, keep that behind closed doors. Was sort of the Zionist right. Democrat. If he if he disagreed, keep it behind closed doors. Yeah. Uh, let the Israelis know. You can have those. That's what you're supposed to do you with know, allies. You're not supposed to air the – if you're if you're doing the airing of public grievances, it's the idea is that uh, you're, you're no longer the same kind of ally anymore. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, we are going to take as many phone calls as we can coming in the next segment. we got a few lines open, so this is a great time to call. If you're on hold already, stay on hold. I will get to you. 1-800-684-3110. That's 1-800-684-3110. Even if you're someone who's putting in a comment on YouTube or comment on Rumble, we'd love to hear your voice. Get that heard around the world. Do that right now. And we couldn't do that. We couldn't even have the phone screener to do it if it wasn't for your support here at the ACLJ. So we are on only 123 one, two, three champions away from our goal of 21,000 new ACLJ champions. Those people that are giving on a recurring basis, be a part of that today. If you can make a singular donation, that's great, too. We know that's most of you, and we encourage you to do that. But if you can become an ACLJ champion, again, someone who has decided to give on a monthly basis, we know how much work, great work can be done when we know what our baseline is. And with you, we can do that. So, again, go to ACLJ.org. Coming up, though. All your calls that we can get to, 1-800-684-3110. Last call to get your call in. Call to call. You're leaving it up to Hamas to decide how to treat uh, U.S. troops. You're leaving it up to uh, these groups like the IRGC and that are that operate in the Gaza Strip. And, of course, the Israelis. I mean, there's an active war going on where there are um, you know, co- non-combatants, they get caught up in, in uh, the conflict as well. And, I mean, I think for the first time in, in all these conflicts that we've seen, uh, we're going to put U.S. troops right in the middle of it. This is total chaos. We, we're going to need to deal with uh, the Palestinian uh, governments. We're going to need to deal with uh, what do we do about getting rid of the bad actors and rebuilding and trying to, to move forward. All of those conversations are legitimate, but not now. The reality is we still have hostages. American hostages. And until Israel gets all of the hostages back, we shouldn't be talking about rebuilding or what comes next. We should be supporting Israel in getting our hostages back and getting the other hostages back. That is the sole focus. This is a sequencing issue. Whether it's the Houthis, whether it's building this port for aid for the Gaza Strip, and while you've got you know 100 plus hostages as you said there's still american hostages some that are alive some that are dead we don't know all the details yet and and yet we're acting like this this is like over what i think that uh we need to be able to do is be very clear as the u.s government that we are supporting israel and getting back the hostages for one and two we're not going to deal with uh hamas 
We're not going to have debates or negotiations with terrorist organizations. And then we can talk about rebuilding, uh, and, and the Arabs are going to have a big role in this. But the first focus, get our American hostages and other hostages back, and then get rid of the Hamas leadership that we can then have conversations with others to talk about rebuilding. All right, we're in that segment. Welcome back uh, to Secchio. We're going to take your phone calls, 1-800-684-3110. Logan, let's hit it. Yeah, let's go ahead. Ruth Ann's calling, Indiana on line four. You're on the air. Ruth Ann. Yes, good afternoon, gentlemen, and thank you for taking the call. As an attorney, I'm a pretty decent retired emergency room nurse, so I have to tell you, I am not giving up on the United States, but I'm very concerned with all of this very obvious corruption, and I have a legal question. With this lawfare that's going on, why cannot President Trump or his team sue these people for malicious prosecution? I mean, listen, at points that you have to take, those are elements. That's a crime, right? So you're suing, or, or at least it's a civil issue if you're suing. Um, so it's not, it doesn't have to be criminal, but you do have to have civil elements. And so it's not that just because you don't like the fact that these crimes, I think that the bigger case you have to make is that you look at all of it together, it's so obvious to people. Does that mean that it's easy to go one after another after another? Now, look, like in Georgia, Fannie Willis, she had to get rid of the special counsel who was brought in, and she'd already given $800,000 to him. That, that's ser seriously impacting her case, and now it's on appeal that she she, she could get removed. And you know, we filed in that yesterday, Logan, saying she should be removed because just removing the special counsel, if that was necessary, then it's necessary to remove her. So that's how you do it. I mean, I, again, I think that – Slander, issues like that. When you're a public figure it's like President Trump, though he has been successful, and occasionally we've seen that in the Hulk Hogan case. I mean, there's been a few of these. Yeah. They are they are few and far between, and they're usually something you would handle, I think, either after or again differently than a, a matter that's criminal. Those are civil usually. Hey, I did want to give you an update. Give us a call, by the way. We'd love to hear from more of you. One eight hundred six eight four thirty one ten. If you're watching this and Curious about the earthquake that happened that, that rattled New York earlier today. Uh, actually, just minutes ago, there was a 2.0 aftershock felt where specifically? Ben Minister, New Jersey. So, you know, take for that whatever you will. I think a lot of, I mean, the headlines are, you know, the Trump course, a hit with earthquake. So, yeah, 2.0, would that even, I mean, I, I don't think that really does that even shake? Does anything. It's just kind of uh, like an interesting fact. Under you while we're walking I think it's an earth? interesting fact. Just say it. Right. Just saying. Let's go on. We put it all together with the put eclipse. It all together. Michael's calling in Florida on line one. Watching on YouTube, which we appreciate. Michael, you're on the air. Hey, Michael. Hey, how you guys doing? I hope all is well. Um, I'm a longtime listener, first time caller. And my question today is with all the indictments and all the court cases are meant to distract President Trump as well as all of us out here listening. Um, what is being done in these states to where the mail in balloting? is not going to be an issue like it was in 2020 uh, to where it, it could be legitimate or not be where yeah. President Trump is winning a state and we wake up 3 o'clock in the morning and he's losing by 4 I mean, million. There was, there, was, there was one issue, obviously, that changed everything, and that was because a lot of state constitutions, Michael, allowed secretaries of states in emergency situations to take actions to uh, to make sure people can vote and so they used COVID as kind of the reason why that you had all these, I mean, live ballots. So it wasn't just that people could request a ballot for no reason because of COVID and you know, the fears of even going out in public and that close of being in line with people, but that you would actually just have ballots mailed out to people live, not not request again, but the actual ballots. I think I got three um, uh, actual live ballots for the presidential election uh, because I lived in different places within 10 years and, and voted in different places. So you had to be, you know, so again, we knew that there were more ballots out there than where people live. Obviously, that situation should not occur this time. Now, what, what states are, have done is looked at, do they need to change their state constitution? For instance, in your, in your home state of Florida, there was an issue of, well, there was no, uh, you could request an absentee ballot for any reason. You didn't have to have a, 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 you know, a doctor's appointment or a trip or any kind of reason at all. And there was a move to remove that that didn't make its way through the, the legal system, uh, so the state legislature. Uh, some of those are going to be challenged in court. Now, most states we know since the last election, Logan, have actually 
tighten their election laws up, particularly red states. And we also know, Michael, that the I think the Republican team and the Trump team at, at large understands that they're going to have to spend a lot more resources uh, doing what we call ballot chasing and making sure that if uh, people do want to vote through the mail, that you don't t- tell people not to because we know that a lot of issues come up on Election Day. Yeah, and, and they give people a, excuses lesson, not to show up. There was a lesson learned in that, which was... Yeah, I'm not saying that was the definitive issue. It doesn't mean issue. that should, should be the way, but you've got to play and deal with the cards that yeah, you're I mean, when you're when you When you bring in a lot of new people, like President Trump does, to the political process who didn't usually vote, and that was kind of his how he got over... How he won the states that Democrats had always been beating Republicans in throughout the Midwest, yeah. and we call kind of the Rust Belt, if you will. We also know that um, those kind of voters... Don't show up if it's not easy. And under COVID, it wasn't easy. It was actually easier to say, well, if I didn't get the ballot sent right to me, or I might not you know, yeah. send it in, or I might not go, or I might be afraid to go, or uh, if I do have something that comes up, I'm not willing to wait you know, two hours in line to cast my vote because seems- these are not people who are like that committed to it. Yeah, and it seems like the main difference this time would be people have to request – to get that ballot, unlike a 2022 right. where, or 2020, where a lot of people were just of that. sending it out in now, mass. There are a few states that that's what they do. Yeah, so they would, it, some of them are like done Oregon, that. Some of, yeah. that's what they do. They're mail-only they're mail, mail only states. Yeah. And they've decided. But, you know, they did that through their legal system. They, they, Colorado and, Colorado, and Oregon. They decided we're going, this is how we're going to do it. So th- I, this is what I say to campaigns at this point. Learn what the rules are in each state. I'll do whatever the law allows you to do to make sure you get as many votes for yourself as you can. All right. Let's, That's all you got to do. All right. I agree. We Let, didn't do that in the last election. No, cycle. no, absolutely not. And during the, the height of COVID, I mean, it was the, the worst time that could yeah. all been happening. Let's go to Kim to wrap up our calls for the day. Kim, you're on the air. Watch on ACLJ.org. I appreciate that. Yeah, so I was calling. I had a quick question. If us as citizens can see all of this, these things going on with Donald Trump is starting to look like a spectacle. Why can't the Supreme Court just jump in and stop all of this? In some federal cases, they could. They could say this is you know, this is a, these are wrong, and we want to, you know, these to be dismissed. They don't have a lot to say in the state court systems. I mean, I don't think you're going to get one Supreme Court case that just says you can't you can't you know come after somebody because it looks absurd, which it does, and it looks like they're being persecuted for being a politician that has your specific views and decided that they were going to put themselves out there again as a candidate. So, you know, what I think we have to do as Americans is you don't elect people who are going to put forward people that are going to put these prosecutions in place. Remember, every one of these people is either elected or appointed by elected officials. So you had a, you had a say and your community had a say. And so, with again, you can't rely on the courts, even the U.S. Supreme Court. You know, they can overturn Roe versus Wade, Logan. But they can't fix every abortion law in every state. That's not how our system no, of government is set up. It's not set up. And, and Will, our producer, wanted me to let you all know that the Supreme Court will hear oral arguments on April 25th, whether former President Trump That's true. is immune from criminal charges in his federal, federal election interference case. Now, so yeah, I just want to give everyone an update. That, that, would, is that coming would in a few weeks. state case. Yep. So th- th- that's what I'm saying. I mean, there are ways they could step in, but even they are limited. Well, we are only 121 champions away. That means a good chunk of you came in today of hitting our 21,000 or no, is it 21,000? Yeah, 21,000 goal. That's 21,000 people who decide I'm giving monthly to the ACLJ. That is amazing. That's, you know, an arena plus that have decided to do that and we cannot be more thankful. So I encourage you right now as our legal work never ends that we need your support, whether you can do a one-time donation or whether you can do a monthly ongoing. Gifts are doubled right now also during this Life and Liberty Drive for the month of April. That is right. The Life and Liberty Drive for the month of April. It's happening right now. Go to ACLJ.org. Have your gifts doubled today. They're tax deductible, and you can do it. Help us in these crucial battles by supporting us during this time. Talk to you on Monday.